Well, thanks. But, you know, I'm only uh, in charge of actually half the presentation. The first part is going to be done by... Uh, I don't know about I don't know about the rest of you, but I immediately started to reach for mine. I thought I was the one that was in trouble. Um, uh, Mark Matsui and uh, is going to do a presentation that they've prepared, uh, Boots to Books, about serving uh, disabled veterans, uh, and that's going to last for about the first half of the session. And then after that's over, we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, we're going to introduce uh, Frank Menjivar, the uh, financial aid supervisor of PCC, who's going to talk about the uh, some of the things that we're doing in the vet's office right now. Uh, uh, trying to help the veterans that are, that are coming to us to uh, study here at Long Beach City College. But I think the, the most important and, and perhaps I hope the most interesting part of the uh, presentation will be that we've, we have four veterans with us and we want to we save maybe the last 40 minutes or so. And they're going to come up and, and uh, uh, brave this group and uh, talk about their experiences in the military and then coming in and um, uh, readjusting back to college life. So, with uh, no further ado, Mark Matsui. Thanks, Mike. Um, with me today are Shauna Hagerman, counselor you've probably seen here at PCC, and Dan Hanch, our learning disability specialist. And part of our presentation, our presentation is going to flow like this. I, I'm going to talk about um, PTSD and some of the statistical stuff and some of the other um, broad-based issues that are, are facing our returning veterans coming to college. And Dan's going to talk about uh, um, traumatic brain injuries and, and other disabilities. And Shauna's going to follow up with the services piece. And um, I'd like to begin by talking about what is the hottest topic for those of us who work in disabled students programs in all of higher education. And that hot topic and that emerging issue is the return of our veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan and those who are returning with various kinds of injuries. Um, primary to that is post-traumatic stress disorder, which we will talk about. Um, the numbers, the VA reports over 300,000 veterans leave the military each year. That's going to be increasing in the years ahead. Um, more than 20% of the existing veterans come to California. And of those, 80% live in Southern California. You know, in the past, in World War II and previous eras, Vietnam, um, a lot of folks that were injured or, or um, were casualties during the war um, did not survive. And because of advances in technology and, and the rapid rate that we are able to get to our injured soldiers, many of them are returning and living productive lives. But as a result of that, there's a high rate of disability that returns. Um, and when we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, depending on who you talk to and where the numbers come from, over 90% of all returning vets have some form of post-traumatic stress disorder. 90%, it's kind of unbelievable. Nearly 98% will experience some form of depression and anxiety, but not necessarily um, to the point where it can be fully categorized as post-traumatic stress disorder. More than 30% will have service-related physical disabilities. And, you know, with the IEDs, the, the the exploding devices that are created in the deserts and, and you know there are a lot of blast injuries and Dan will talk more about the effects of blast injuries. Over 50 percent of those veterans ex exiting have a strong desire to go to college. Uh, only 10 percent of those veterans actually find their way to college or a vocational program. Of that 10 percent that do attend, there is nearly a 70% attrition rate. So, you know, we talk here at the college about our success and retention and persistence rates. Among our veterans, 70% walk away at some point. Of that 70% that drop out of school, 60% return to the military. And some of that is based, much of that is based on 
the difficulties they have with the transitional issues. Now, one of the things that the military does to, to help our service people that are in, um, in these different conflicts is they, they prepare them psychologically. And you may have heard of the battle mind training that soldiers go through. And it's designed to, to prepare soldiers for battle. Because when you're making that transition from civilian life to military life in a war zone, you have to have the right kind of mindset to do that. Now, as you can see with these comparisons, and I won't go through all of them, um, targeted aggression versus inappropriate aggression. Well, the inappropriate aggression is as you return to civilian life. If that battle mind training is still in effect and you're not able to make that transition appropriately or you have difficulty making that transition, that can be a problem. And so we need to get some assistance with that. Now, we talked about post-traumatic stress disorder, re-experiencing, avoiding reminders of, uh, and numbing emotions and arousal issues. Um, my father, my father, is, he just turned 89, and he's a decorated World War II veteran, fought with the uh, 100th Battalion and the 442nd in Italy during World War II. And um, one of his friends, one of his veteran friends, they they found that they could get PTSD diagnosis by going to the VA if they're having certain issues. And so he said, okay, well, you know, that's gonna impact the, the benefits that I'm getting from the VA. And so they, they all got together to do this. Well, my dad went and he started seeing the psychologist to do this evaluation. And one of the things that happened was triggers, flashbacks. You know, in the 60s, we talked about LSD and having flashbacks after you quit using but it's the same kind of flashback. And so my dad started having nightmares and it started impacting his sleep. And, and as part of the diagnostic process, he was supposed to do some journaling. And I found some of what he had written, and this is like five years ago or so. And it was very graphic stuff. And back in World War II when he was in Italy, part of the difficulties in the ba big battle that he was in, at that time in the war, this is 1944, and the, and the Nazis are on the run, they were using very young soldiers, you know, 15-year-olds. And he would see them after the battle because they, were, they had been killed. And it was really graphic, and those kinds of images triggered the PTSD. So it can, it can come a week later after you get out, it can come six months, it can come a year. In my father's case, it can come 60 years after the event. Other reactions, depression, anger, aggressive behavior. Um, we talked about, um, about the numbing effect. Well, you know, a lot of people address the numbing issue by self-medicating. And so consequently, a number of veterans get caught up in substance abuse issues. I'm going to show you a video real quick. It's 2003, over 23,000 soldiers have been diagnosed with PTSD. And that's one of the reasons the Army is initiating this chain teaching program. Our medical editor, Dr. Paul Little, joins us now, and he takes a closer look at the symptoms of PTSD and MTBI. Sir? And Dan, the 23,000 that you mentioned are only the ones that we've diagnosed. There are many more out there who are suffering and haven't gotten help. Now, I talked with one veteran who went through the agony of PTSD for years because he just didn't realize he had a problem. The thing that I've, uh, learned is it wasn't Desert Storm. It wasn't even the stress of Afghanistan or Iraq. For First Sergeant Cornell Soignier, it happened when he got back home. After coming back to Fort Benning, uh, <clears throat> I had a soldier who committed suicide. It's still tough on me to this day. Uh, to walk in the barracks room, and to see a soldier, brain splattered on the wall, skull splattered everywhere. That was tough. That was really tough. It's 
Soigne had all the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, flashbacks, nightmares, anxiety, irritability, withdrawal from friends and family, difficulty concentrating and adjusting to home. All of that is very normal to be expected. In most soldiers, those symptoms will fade over time. However, in some soldiers, the symptoms continue or get worse and interfere with their functioning with their friends, their family, or their work. And that's when you need help, because medics need to determine if it's PTSD or if it could also be mild traumatic brain injury. A lot of us remember from our days playing high school sports, getting our bells rung, getting a concussion. With traumatic brain injury, that's what we're talking about. So how do doctors tell the difference with MTBI? These aren't symptoms that start six months or a year later. They start within a day or two after the injury. So how do you get help? First of all, with this new chain teaching program, everyone from senior leaders to squad leaders learns that it's okay to get help. It's not gonna mess up your career. We want to have every soldier recognize that symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder are common, are expected, and are treatable. It all starts with talking about your feelings with someone you trust. It doesn't matter where you start, just so you start. First Sergeant Soigner got help, and he's back to normal. And he's on a mission to get the word out that it's okay to ask for help. Everybody understands and everybody knows, you know, so hey, let's deal with it. Let's find out what we need to do to be able to get this thing up under control and help people. Now, the first sergeant has a great message there. And, you know, still the best place to get help is our old favorite, militaryonesource.com. So you, you, you heard Sergeant Swanier talk about suicidal thoughts. And the suicide rates among veterans are very high. In, in 2007, they were the highest in 26 years, with 99 veterans committing suicide successfully. The VA also indicates that 12,000 veterans attempt each year. So this is very serious business we're talking about and it's very sobering. Um, so what do we do? A strength-based approach, you know, be sensitive of course. Promote resiliency. That's much of what the military talks about in, in terms of making the transition, being resilient. Uh, focus on the strengths and skills that the warriors and veterans bring with them and help them be part of the solution. And one of the things that we talk about in disabled students is the use of universal design principles. One of the things being, as today, you know, we, we run a PowerPoint, I gave you a copy of the PowerPoint so you can read with it. You know, read it along with it, not just hand somebody something, but make sure they understand it. You know, so principles of universal design. Okay, and I'm finished, Dan. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to echo the uh, sentiments of the person who greeted us this morning by um, was saying how, how important it is for us to um, have these kind of meetings. Um, I think it's a way of honoring our, the service of our veterans by learning, out, learning about how we can help them um, make often the difficult transition um, back home and also back to school. So I just want to start with that. Let me get my... Uh, my presentation together. Now, I didn't do what Mark did. I didn't pass out pa copies of my PowerPoint, but um, but if you if you want them, just I could absolutely make sure you get them. I could I could email them to you. But uh, let's see. Let me get myself together here. Oops. All right. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. So I wanted to um, for just start with this this slide. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to be talking about a specific piece of this puzzle that um, called TBI or traumatic brain injuries. But I, I think I wanted to start by saying that that with, often with the case with our, our soldiers that come back that that have TBI, um, TBI is in, in isolation. Um, it often exists with other issues, and it's a little bit different than like with people who have head injuries. 
um, in like in a sports situation. A, a TBI is never easy, but what happens um, is that the soldiers coming back with TBI are also dealing with these other issues as well, like post-traumatic stress, substance abuse, depression, pain management, having to deal with surgery. So it, it's this dynamic, it's, a, it's like the zone in the center that really complicates matters. And, it, and each of these issues make the other issues harder to deal with. Um, so I just wanted to really drive that point home. Okay. Okay. So now here's, here's kind of an unbelievable statistic, but I know Mark kind of alluded to it, but um, the estimate is, is that about 20% of all of our service personnel, of the 1.4 million um, soldiers that have served in Iraq and Afghanistan, have sustained some kind of a brain injury. Now, fortunately, most, most of them have been mild, uh, but it's a really, it's, a, it's an unbelievable statistic. <clears throat> so, we're going to see people, undoubtedly, with, with these issues. Um, and part of, the, part of the other part of the puzzle is that, or, is that because they're mild, they're mild kinds of injuries, and soldiers are so tough, and you know, they're trained to, you know, to, to take the pain and go on and do their job, most people who have these injuries don't get treated. They, they endure the injury, they, you know, they're, they're exposed to an explosion, they shake it off, they get up, and they go back to work. <clears throat> and, um, but like in that, in that video we were watching, when they get back to base, they start feeling the symptoms. So most people don't get treated. And that's, that's something that I'm going to talk a little bit about a little, a little later here. Okay. Okay. So just a real quick kind of, um, this, this um, slide, I just want to talk a little bit about what a, a, a brain injury is. <clears throat> There's a whole complicated way of um, organ, or organizing what brain injuries are, but um, a TBI is a specific type of brain injury. Any type of brain injury falls under the umbrella of what we call an acquired brain injury, and a traumatic brain injury, and that's what our soldiers are dealing with, those are injuries that um, are caused by external forces coming into the brain. And so they're, they're different than brain injuries like, like strokes or um, disease injuries from caused from disease. So TBIs are injuries from external forces. And you can even reduce that down further by, um, by discern, discerning closed injuries and open injuries. And the, the pictures on the right are, are I guess, CAT scans. On the, bot on the bottom is a picture of an open head injury. And those are particularly devastating. And the one on top is a closed head injury. But both can be really serious. In fact, <clears throat> the actress um, Miranda Richardson just yeah just um, had a had a fall, had a closed head injury, but um, but she she died from it because it was, she had some profound bleeding on, on the brain, so it can be really serious. Um, okay. So here's <clears throat> here's a picture of a brain, and some some kids that look really hungry. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so the point of this picture is, um, actually, that's not a brain, that's a, that's a jello mold. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those. They have these jello molds that you can you know, make in the shape of a brain. But it serves the point to, uh, this, to say that the, the fragility of the brain is a lot like the consistency of jello. Like if you read about it, you hear the neurosurgeons will say, oh, it's like, you know, it feels like jello or tapioca or, or butter. So it's really, um, you know, unbelievably delicate. <clears throat> and the brain, it's, uh, so it's floating around inside our skulls, and it's um, encased in this fluid, which is uh, a cerebral spinal fluid, and it's um, kind of like the, our evolutionary shock absorber. But it's moving around a little bit, and uh, um, it's, it's okay to move it around a little bit, but when you get... Um, exposed to explosions or car accidents where there's quick acceleration and deceleration, that's where you get problems. And that's where the, um, these injuries can, can occur. In fact, I have a little animation just to drive home the point here. Let me see if I can get this to work. I haven't tried this yet. Let's see. And, oh, okay. So that's kind of what's happening. Like if you're in, a, in an accident, you're basically your, your brain is getting jostled around 
And so, you know, you can all think of it, oops, let me cancel that. Like, if you, if you had that jello, if you, let's say you put that jello mold in a little container of water, <clears throat> and uh, you put some rocks in there to mimic like, the, the hard surfaces of the uh, interior of the, the skull, and you shook it around, you're, you're, you're going to get some tearing, and you're going to get some ripping, and that's what happens to our brain when, um, when we have these kinds of injuries. Okay. Now this is actually a picture that was just taken after an IED exploded. <clears throat> and so you see the guy in the picture, he's holding his head, and, um, and this is really common. In fact, I can maybe ask the panel. My understanding is that if, if these guys that, that are on patrol, within a week or two, they're going to experience something like this. Like within a week or two, this is something that is fairly frequent that happens. These explosions happen all the time. Um, again, the, ma the majority of which are mild, unfortunately, but um, even, if there, even if there are apparently no symptoms, there's no outward like, injuries, there can still be some um, internal injuries, like we saw on that last slide. So what's happening, these guys are coming back to base, to their base, and they're immediately, they're, they're experiencing these kind of immediate effects, with these deficits in um, cognition and emotional regulation and also some physical uh, problems like headaches. But um, so, um, you know, you, as a soldier, they're, they're trained to be tough and they, they generally just go back to work. And, and that's the other part of the story. Um, there's, and this is a really important thing that's happening. And, and they know it in sports. If you get hurt in sports, if you get knocked out for a little bit, you can't play, you get benched. But with our soldiers, they got to go back to work, and and that's really dangerous, <clears throat> particularly if the frequency of those concussions occur in short intervals. You could have like five concussions over five years; that might be okay. But when they're when they're kind of bunched up together, like within a year, that's when um, you, you, your your maybe temporary injuries could be uh, transformed into permanent injuries. So. Um, I think the military is really looking at that right now, and they're trying to screen soldiers better so that they can prevent the temporary injuries from turning to permanent injuries. Okay. All right. Now, the other, the other thing, too, um, about these blast injuries, these IEDs, and most people have heard about these IEDs, um, that, um, so th th the thing was, they couldn't understand, there were, there were these, Explosions happening all the time, and some soldiers that were kind of near the explosion, and they were, they were um, not apparently hurt, they were experiencing these symptoms of um, TBI, and they didn't understand it for the longest time. But there's a, a kind of an understanding now, a working theory of what's happening. And it's called, um, well, they call it, technical term is called borrowed trauma. And basically, when you get hit with a, well, when you're in the presence of an explosion, um, depending on the, the force of the explosion, the, the uh, pressure wave can travel through the atmosphere of up to 1,500 miles an hour. So, you know, just imagine getting hit by something that's moving at 1,500 miles an hour. And there's two things that happen. The initial wave hits your body, it can knock you down. But then the dangerous thing, apparently, is the second wave, that the energy goes through your body. Because we have openings in our body, we're not encased in steel. So the force goes through our body, and, and the thinking is that it's ripping and tearing apart our organs. And in the case of the brain, what they're thinking is that, that as the force is moving through the body, it's forcing the blood to spike um, into the brain. And, and so the, the wave goes through into the brain. And this next picture is, <clears throat> well, it's, it's not a photograph, but it's, it's what um, they're thinking is what's happening to like the individual brain cells. And we've got a we've got a hundred billion brain cells in our in our brain, and they're all talking to each other. So the the, the thinking is is that when these these brain cells get damaged, then they they lose we, we start losing function, and and our brain cells are really the building blocks of who we are. So so it's a um, a very they're, so they're, they're just trying to understand it better. And this was actually, this, that, 
that last picture was from a Popular Mechanics um, article that came out last year. Here's another thing that they're also thinking of. There's these big structures in our brain too. Um, they're they're uh, are they? They're um, connective structures. They're part of they're they're part of the um, the brain cell, but it's actually it's the white matter. It's like the little tails of the the brain cells that are bunching up and they they bunch up and they connect the the big like uh, circuits of, or the big cables within our brain together, and they're concerned that even those those structures are vulnerable vulnerable too and can shear away. Okay, so all right, um, a little bit more about like the manifestations of brain injuries, and we've known this for a long time in DSPS. Brain you know, brain injuries affect everything. It's it's an all inclusive disability. Um, everything happens from your brain, so it affects. If you have deficits, if you have a, if you stay in a brain injury, it's possible you're going to have deficits in all of these areas: movement, sensory, so on. Okay. So, um, now I also had a video too, but uh, let's see. Mind, mind if I can get mine going? Let's see if I can. Okay, this is from a. We're going okay. to take a closer look at the military's failure to diagnose and treat the signature wound of the Iraq War, traumatic brain injury, or TBI. A Pentagon memo uncovered this morning by USA Today warns that the military lacks a comprehensive plan to identify and care for soldiers with TBI. And on Capitol Hill, House Democrats called for $450 million to research and treat TBI. They said brain-injured troops should have the same chance at recovery that ABC's Bob Woodruff did, who also suffered TBI in Iraq. Bob discovered that many troops with such brain injuries went undiagnosed for years. Tonight, Bob has one soldier's story. Gina Hardy never had a chance to enjoy her husband's homecoming from Iraq. He returned with back problems, a bad knee, and another injury no one could see. You see pictures of soldiers coming home and reunited with their families, and it's, everything's great. We didn't have that kind of reunion. When I saw him for the first time, he just, I was disappointed. He was just different, and I, I couldn't understand why. What they didn't know at the time is that Warren Hardy was suffering from the effects of an undiagnosed traumatic brain injury. He's not exactly the man I married. He's not the same person. Warren Hardy came to California from England 12 years ago for a job in the Silicon Valley. He met Gina, fell in love with her, and with America. Following the terrorist attacks of 9-11, the Hardys both enlisted in the Army. Gina was stationed in Germany. After Warren became a U.S. citizen, he was sent to Iraq. This is probably around about 20 minutes after we got here. A few months into his tour, his armored vehicle rolled over a bomb. An explosion whipped Hardy violently around inside. The person actually took this picture, so we actually went in the air about 10 feet. He blacked out, but military doctors didn't screen him for a head injury. They checked his knees and sent him back into the fight two days later. And how were you able to, to be as a, as a soldier then? I knew there was something wrong. I was always banging my head against different obstacles, and it's like my memory of what's around me wasn't keeping that information. What's this? When Warren Hardy returned to California, his family grew and grew and grew. He was still having problems with concentration. His memory was failing, and he found he was unable to return to work. I couldn't even comprehend a paragraph of this complex stuff. It just let nothing ever sunk in. And the harder I tried, the more frustration I got. I used to be a software engineer. I had an incredible memory, and now I'm struggling. It wasn't until two years after his injury that doctors at the VA finally diagnosed Hardy with traumatic brain injury. The bottom line is people return to their communities and they carry their head injuries. Well, there are many of them that carry the effects for life. Do you think he'll improve? I, I, I can't say, but you know, he's, he's still my husband. I still made a commitment and, and I still love him more than anything. Warren Hardy fears there may be thousands of other returning servicemen suffering in silence. It's not that the military is leaving you behind, Hardy says, it's that they don't know they are leaving you behind. Bob Woodruff, ABC News, Campbell, California. 
The Hardys do have one less thing to worry about. Friends and neighbors raised more than $90,000, allowing them to make a down payment on a home. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I actually apologize for the, the, the amount of information on this slide. Um, it's, I know it's really busy, but um, it does convey the, the reality of, of all the different and complex problems that people with TBI deal with, and uh, particularly in a, in a school setting. Um, now, the three things that, were, three things that pop out here um, on, on this slide are the, the difficulties that you can kind of put them in themes. The executive function disturbances, that's a, that's a term for just um, thinking control, our, our, our ability to have control of, of how we think and stay, stay um, on task. Um, neurobehavioral disturbances, that, that's memory and um, uh, processing, sensory problems, mood disturbances and emotional difficulties. So there, there are a lot of things that um, impact a person with TBI. I think as like student services personnel, um, probably the, the intersection that we're going to have in terms of what their difficulties are, are and, and where we can help them is in this area of executive functioning. It's helping people um, uh, stay on track and as students do the things that they have to do, help them plan and get through the bureaucracy of registration. So that's where I think we're going to be um, finding that we can be the most helpful. Okay. Um, and I've actually got a handout that what I've done is I've, I've tried to put together some good strategies that actually tap into the different types of, typical types of deficits that occur with TBI. Is that on that yellow sheet? There's a lot of information there. And, and I, was, I, wanted, I was kind of struggling and thinking, well, how, how do you make this, how can you take this away and make it meaningful to you? So I came up with kind of an idea. You know, we were, we, I was just talking about, you know, executive functioning. It's kind of, that's sort of like the, the little pilot in our brain that, you know, it's, that's the resource in our brain that allows us to control what we're doing, our planning, multitasking, things like that. So I have this little, little analogy. When you're with somebody who, who has a TBI, um, think, of, think of yourself or think of the qualities of, of like an air traffic controller. You know, the, the, like in the movie that they're talking to a pilot that's kind of not got full control of the airplane. And our, our job or the job of the air traffic controller is to help them get through the night and so they don't crash. So what are the qualities that, that someone like that would bring to their job? Well, they'd want to give clear directions. Um, they'd be willing to repeat and clarify directions. Patience. And um, breaking things down to ma manageable steps. So I just want to leave you with that, that kind of image. Okay. Any questions? Or... All right. Thank you, Sean. You're up. Okay. Because <laughs> it kind of ties in. Seriously? I don't have any flashy um, PowerPoints to show you, but I just wanted to sort of bring it together then. So now we have all the sobering news about people coming in and, and having a disability of some sort. Uh, and I know that, um, well, I don't know anything, but I can imagine that veterans do not want to be labeled as disabled. It carries a stigma. It carries a stigma for all of us. So, um, of course, our office is called Disabled Student Services, unfortunately, sometimes. And uh, so we're here to help. However, veterans sometimes, number one, don't know. They might have a learning difficulty. They, they don't know what our office could do for them. Um, we provide accommodations for several kinds of disabilities. We've been just talking about two types of disabilities. You know, you can imagine some of the physical disabilities that might that people might uh, be coming in and presenting us with. So we accommodate an individual. So we have a certain set of accommodations that we provide, testing assistance, uh, specialized tutoring, registration assistance, uh, help with financial aid, um, helping people break things down into small manageable steps, giving clear directions. But um, I think our role also 
will be obviously to work with returning veterans to help them understand how some of these types of disabilities may affect their learning. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear, I think, now how this may affect somebody's ability to take in information, remember it, and bring it back out onto a test. Uh, it, it would be very difficult. So our job is to help them manage a disability so we can really get to what they're learning and so they can present it back to the instructor um, and be able to be successful in school. It might be uh, taking reduced units, we may need to talk to instructors, we may need to assist the veterans in learning how to communicate their needs to instructors. You know, you don't have to say your whole life story. You know, you can come in and say, this is what I need and this is what I've been approved for and you really don't have to get into your personal business if you don't want to. Um, and I know the panel will probably talk about having to manage their life. Uh, you know, the VA is a cumber, cumbersome system, and uh, there are times that, you know, they may have been waiting for an appointment for six months, and that appointment might fall on the final. And they have to go to this appointment, and sometimes instructors don't understand. So our office can assist in that communication and teach the, the returning vet and student um, how to advocate appropriately for themselves. So that's sort of what we do. It's all very individualized. That's all I have. We're going to um, go out of order here. Uh, one of the veterans that we have with us today needs to, have, needs to be somewhere. And, uh, and so we're going to go ahead and do the uh, veterans presentations. And that's my part. And when I'm done, uh, Frank will step up and talk about some of the things that we're currently doing in the, um, in the Veterans Affairs Office to help our veterans. Uh, it's, it's really my great honor uh, to uh, introduce these uh, fine young men and fine young women. And uh, we're going to start out with uh, Ixa Seals. Ixa, why don't you come on up? Now, each of these veterans is going to tell you to the extent that they wish, uh, you know, uh, their, about their military service. But in particular, we want them to describe what it was like to leave the military and come back to civilian life, and in particular, be integrated back into Long Beach City College. Ixa? Hi, um, my name is Ixa Seals, and I work in the Veterans Affairs Office as well, um, as work study. And been the mil I was in the military from the age of 17 to 24, no, wait, 23. <laughs> I, was, I was in there for a while. And um, my experience, like, I was, they used to call me a spoiled little Navy girl because my first duty station was Italy. Being 17, turning 18, no bills in a foreign country, and Working for an admiral, I had it made, so it was nice. Um, from there, uh, I went to the East Coast, got stationed shore duty again, which is also nice because I was able to basically have a nine to five job and then leave and have my own life outside of that. Then it came down to my first ship, which was aboard the USNS Sirius. And on there, I still didn't experience the real military life until we got to where we had to help supply as far as for like the war in Iraq and everything like that. When it came down to that, the military life became real because it was like 360 to what I'm used to. It was more of always have to be alert, always have to stay, pay attention to what's going on. And we knew that any mistake that we made can cost us not just our lives, but you know, we were also bringing the supplies and doing things to help out with the people that are actually fighting the war on land. It was, a, it was an experience that I do want to go back. I'm not going to lie. I do want to go back to the military because I do miss the travel and the adrenaline rush and everything that was going on. And when I got out to transition, it was a lot of stuff I did not know as far as like schooling and what kind of health care was out there. I didn't know that I can go to the VA for free. And that was, that was something I found out about probably two years ago. And it was an opportunity that I took advantage of, you know, making sure that I had proper health care because, you know, going to a civilian doctor, people that don't know about 
people coming from the war and the military and things like that. You know, I wanted to go for a physical. The doctor I had at the time, she was like, oh, okay, let's do your breathing test. Okay, your physical's done. I'm like, I'm used to, you know, the, the blood work and everything like that. And ever since I've been to the VA, I found out a lot of health issues I had to deal with. And transitioning, being able to know that these things are available was a lot of help. Coming to school, that was also a help because it helped me further my career. Because even though you spend time in the military, a lot of people will not hire you if you don't have the certain degrees. And me being an IT in the military and coming out, I was like, okay, I can give me a job. But a lot of people without the degrees would not hire me. So it was like transitioning was a hard thing. And there was a lot of stuff in transitioning class, tap class, that they did not tell us about. And I know we have a lot of vets coming through the VA that tells us, you know, we didn't know about this in TAP class. We didn't know that we're able to um, give medical help and everything like that. Because basically in TAP class, they're like, okay, well, you're done. Bye. See you later. And so it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do. But with me transitioning out, it was something that took about three years to get used to. Because not only did I have myself, I had my son to look after. And it was like me being used to a certain schedule and now going to like, hmm, I have to find a job. I have to make sure I have a house and everything like that. Was a, it was difficult. It was, a, it was a real difficult. But in the end, like I said, I would go back. If I had the chance to, I would go back and do it all over again. Because it was a, a experience that made my life where it is now. Now, unlike, you know, not like the guys that had probably more in debt as far as what happened on the field. Like I said, I was a spoiled little Navy girl. So I only dealt with outside of the range. It was, I don't know. I want to go back to experience more. So that's, that's like going to school. I'm glad, you know, I had met Frank when I first got here. And he dealt with me in my going in and out of school for the past four years. <laughs> so, you know, when we had people like um, Frank to help and Danielle. And, and the guys that were here um, in the VA office to help with the transition, it helps a lot because they understand where you're coming from and they understand what, you, what the guidance and stuff that you need. And they don't give up on you like some people do because um, they understand. And that's the best thing. That's a lot of things that a lot of people do have to realize. Um, that when vets do come out, they do need somebody that understands where they're coming from and they don't understand like, okay, well, I was getting this much a month, now I'm down to being broke and not unemployed. They need their help and they need their guidance. You know, I one vet, there's one vet that has sleep disorders because of PTSD and he couldn't finish school. So he had to make sure that everybody understood that and he didn't get failed or withdrawal and owe anybody any money. I think that's the biggest thing that helps us when you do have people that listen to you. So, yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Do we have any questions, Alexa? I have a question. You spoke of TAP. Can mm -hmm. you kind of explain what TAP is? TAP is the class when you're getting out. It's a class that they send you to. I think it's like a week. I don't remember much because it was basically some place to put the people getting out when they're not doing no job. <laughs> That's all I get. But it's supposed to help you transition from civilian life to, I mean, from military life to civilian life. And the, I guess depending on where you're stationed at and, and if you have people that really want to help you, it can actually work for some. My TAP class, we basically didn't do too much. <laughs> so, I mean, I wish I had a better TAP class. But that's, that's what its purpose is supposed to be, is that it's supposed to help you get out and be able to transition and know your options when you do get out. So. And how long did it last? I believe a week. I'm trying to remember because it was a long time ago. So yeah, I believe a week, a week of, um, you know, they had different careers coming in. They had the police department coming in. They had, um, you know, certain schools, but it was like ITT and stuff like that. It was not actually a college college, but they had like, what are those called? Right. Yeah, like ITT and everything like that coming in to help us, so. Any other questions? Hi, my name is Chris Kong. 
and I uh, served in, in the Marine Corps from 2002 to 2006. And um, during my service, I did two deployments. Uh, I served all over, the, uh, all over the world and also in Iraq. And uh, during my work in the military, I, was, I actually went into a unit where uh, I was given a very, very large responsibility um, despite my lower rank uh, when I came in. And uh, you can say uh, my experience in the military, um, I had a lot of pressure put on me at all times. And I, I saw some things in Iraq. Uh, I did some things that I thought were, um, were important uh, as far as uh, fighting the war. But when I came back from my second deployment, uh, and started to transition out and get ready to come back home, uh, I was really excited to tell my friends and family what I had done. And when I came back home, I decided that maybe I shouldn't tell them about it because of certain things I did do. So um, when people did ask about what I did in the military, I just told them it was, it was fun so, um, sometimes, and sometimes it, it wasn't. And so when I got out of the Marine Corps, I decided to enroll in Long Beach City College uh, because this is my hometown, this is where I grew up. And I expected uh, everything to be the same. I knew um, my friends before, had a family over here, and I thought it would be a smooth transition. But when I came back, I, I felt like um, I wasn't able to connect with people uh, the same way um, so I enrolled in school, I enrolled with the VA um, to get my GI Bill, and um, I guess everything was set. Um, the only um, issues I had um, at the time were uh, that I had to find a job, I had to figure out how um, I would succeed in college, because I was never in a college um, setting before, and I also... Uh, started to uh, think about the things I did in my service almost every day. And um, going to school was fun. I had no, no trouble uh, taking my classes, earning my um, um, A's, B's. Um, everything was fine with that. But uh, the issues I had was um, these, these waves of um, random thoughts about my service, about what I did, and um, how I would um, try to put them aside. So my uh, first six months out, I was, I was having a lot of difficulty uh, paying attention in class, uh, talking about topics on Iraq, especially during that time, um, they were talking about it a lot. And um, I would just choose not to uh, speak on that. And I also had issues with um, uh, my, my overall health. I started to have back problems. I started to um, have uh, trouble sleeping, and uh, and I, I chose not to tell anyone about it because I expected, because I, I was a Marine, I expected um, something else of myself. I didn't expect to complain or tell anyone about my problems because that's not what, what we did. And because um, our mindset over there was um, pretty much not, it's pretty much just to give away your life if, if you had to. And so coming back, um, what, what do you know? I'm still here. So how do I, I come out of that mindset was, was an issue. So um, eventually I started to uh, go to the VA. I, I started to go to the VA because I had to, I had to do something about it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad I took that step. So when I went to the VA, I finally talked to uh, the transition center. They told me about all my benefits. They told me everything was going to be OK, because anything I needed, they would help me find. So from there on, um, I've been uh, doing uh, well in school and also um, slowly stepping towards uh, being the person I, I, I was before. Um, I'm, more, I'm more open now with uh, fellow classmates, 
I try to participate in uh, most of the discussions now, which is, um, it was very difficult to do because I didn't feel like I could uh, be myself because of my experiences. And, uh, and, and I owed a lot to the financial aid office and the Veterans Affairs office here. Uh, I met um, some of my fellow peers here and they, uh, they, they helped guide me because I was um, constantly running into dead ends. And uh, I appreciate uh, everyone who's making the effort to uh, inform the veterans of what kind of services are out there. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have. I have spoken with a psychologist. And um, I just told them about um, any kind of issues I had, and they, uh, they took all the necessary steps to, to just get me help. And you think that helped? Well, everyone has their experiences with the VA. Um, some, some people like their experiences with the VA, some people don't. Um, I have my own personal view on that, which um, I can't really speak for all veterans, but um, I'd like to say the VA is, is a good uh, source for help. Yes. What's your area of study at Long Beach City? Well, I was, going, I was going into criminal justice, but I switched it over to public administration. So that's, that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, he's at uh, Dominguez Hills right now. Get, getting ready, ready to graduate? Yes, um, I'll be finishing my, my uh, bachelor's degree uh, this May. Well, when I came back, it wasn't, um, you know, if you look at me, you'll, you'll see a young guy. You won't be able to tell that I'm a veteran, most likely. So um, it just really took me telling them that I'm a veteran or um, telling anyone else. Uh, but you just have to try to um, find who the veterans are and make sure they are um, checking into all the steps they need to. Um, whether or not they think they uh, need it or not, at least ask them about it. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Yes. And one of the things that Chris said, and you really can't underestimate this, is uh, is the uh, mental toughness that is uh, really demanded of you when you're a soldier. Uh, you know, they, they can work 20-hour days in 120-degree heat and, and then come back here and begin to have some, you know, thoughts that they can't get rid of. And, my, my God, I'm a Marine. I should, I should be able to control these things. And oftentimes it takes a while to go and, and ask for the help that's needed. Next we have uh, Ozzy Lemus. How you guys doing? Uh, all right, uh, my name is Ozzy Limas. Uh, I served in the Marine Corps from 2001 to 2005. And um, during my time of service, I did two tours in Iraq. I was there in 03, um, the invasion. I was there for, I don't know, probably like five to six months. Um, at that time, it was just more of a advanced party, a kind of, I was a supply guy, warehouse guy. But I was more in the front, um, organizing everything so when my unit would show up, everything would be set up. Um, my second tour, well, let me go back. I came back in June, July, end of June. Um, came home, Pen I was stationed at Camp Pendleton, and after that, in January, I went back again. So I only had like six months of just kind of kicking back, getting everything together. Not even six months, actually, a few months, because then after that, we started getting ready to go back again. Um, I went back in 04 in late January, and I came back in late September. Um, in my second tour, I did more of a, my job, actually warehouse, but um, unfortunately I was mortared 
in the camp that I was stationed at probably at least six times a day for six months. Um, for people that don't know what mortar means, it's when they kind of throw bombs, kind of missiles at your camp. And honestly, it's like that's like 90 something percent. Everybody that goes over there gets mortared all the time. So it's not what you, it wasn't just me. If you're stationed under in Iraq, you always get mortared in the camps. So that um, kind of made me feel kind of numb when I, you guys talking about the numb thing earlier. You get mortared so much times that after a while, you just, it's a way of life. You start thinking like, well, if it happens, it happens, I don't care. Now, after you discharge, that mindset still kind of travels over to the civilian life. Um, I, I got out in 05 and I thought it was my, uh, my transition was gonna be kind of smooth. Same thing, kind of like Chris. I came back from Long, to Long Beach, which was kind of where I grew up at, where I have family, my friends, and everything was like totally opposite. I didn't relate with no one, not even with my friends that I grew up with. They were just like, all right, yeah, we're friends and everything, but at the same time, I didn't really socialize as much with them. I started kind of isolating myself, kind of doing things myself, just, uh, I wouldn't isolate myself like saying, go sit in a room and in the corner and not talk to anybody. I overbooked myself with like my schedule, my daily schedule with tons of activities. And so when people won't see that I was isolating myself, I was just doing things. You know, everybody was like, oh look, you know, Ozzy's doing great. You know, he's going to school, he's doing this, he's doing that. But at the same time, it was hurting me in the long run. Um, I decided to go back to school in 2006 and then that transition was kind of hard also, um, due to the same reasons. I came back to school to a city college and where half of the other guys, and well, the majority of the students are straight out of high school, their mentality was way different. I was 25 years old when I, 26 when I went back in to school. So, you know, 26 year old dealing with an 18 year old, you know, it was hard for me to kind of even socialize with anybody. So I would just go in, go to class, do my work and leave. I didn't really socialize with anybody in there, just, and due to the point that I didn't want people asking me questions, you know, proud of my service, but at the time, I wasn't ready to talk about my service with other people, you know, because everybody, if you know somebody from that went to, to Iraq, everybody tells you, oh, how was it Iraq? They always ask you, how was it, how was it? You know, I probably went 300 times, you know, telling the same story. Um, you know, by me going to school, I wasn't, I wouldn't even wear like military shirts, I won't, you know, Try to look t totally opposite so when people weren't really seeing that that I was in, you know, a veteran. So it, it, it was kind of hard. And slowly I started doing it, you know, going to school. Um, uh, when I got discharged of the service, I kind of got um, service connected, you know, kind of disability. And actually 60% um, disabled. So if you look at me, you're like, well, that guy doesn't look disabled to me. But not physically, you know, I got... You know, I got diagnosed with PTSD, TBI, mild TBI, um, bad knees, bad back. So, so a lot of little minor stuff to me, you know, to me is like, well, it's, you know, there are disabilities, but hey, you know, I got to keep going. So coming back, all those little symptoms start kicking in in school. And, you know, my lack of concentration was just like, I'll read paragraphs, you know, chapters, and I have to read it once, twice, because I, I, I wouldn't, you know, understand what they were trying to say. Um, you know, as for the, like, the PTSD side, I was always sitting in the back, in the corner, because I didn't want nobody walk, kind of walking behind me or anything, you know, just kind of watching everybody and just doing my thing and just, like I said, I would just go to school, do my, do my work and leave. I really didn't have that much friends in school um, until I started meeting with other veterans and then I, that's when I started kind of networking and kind of using that peer support, like, hey, you know, how are you doing it? How are you doing that? You know. And that's how we started, and that's how I'm keep you know keep doing. That's what I'm doing now. Um, as for you know coming to school, it did help me out a lot. You know I didn't know about the disabled student service, um, um, and I actually enrolled like a year and a half, almost two years after kind of I was in school. I didn't know about it, and I was like, well, if I knew before, I would have you know kind of got help. But even when I once I knew it, I was eligible, I still didn't go. Because I was kind of like that, that stigma. I'm like, well, I don't know about that. And it was funny because once I did go and I started going to school, in the first day of school in the semester, the instructor said, oh, well, I got somebody that he needs a note taker and this, this, and that. And after that, they said, oh, who, you know, 
who's the person, whatever, and I kind of raised my hand, and everybody looked at me, and I was like, well, you hear little whispers, like, that guy doesn't look disabled to me. And I'm like, well, to me, it's like now, it's like I feel more comfortable. I was like, yeah, whatever. I could talk about my military service. I was like, oh, it was, people haven't asked me. A couple people have, and then I just said, hey, I was in service. I, you know, I got kind of hurt, whatever, in Iraq or whatever, and they can like they kind of drop it. And, and when they, when or sometimes when they do ask, I kind of know how to direct the conversation to something else. So, you know, it's been my, that transition from the beginning right out of the service it was kind of hard, and it's still hard, but. I already kind of learned how to deal with it and, you know, specific issues, how to, you know, direct questions to somewhere else. But, you know, now probably 90% of my friends are all vets. And they're going through the same thing I'm, I went through. You know, and I tell these guys, hey, are you know you're eligible for this. Are you eligible for that? But at the same time, they got that stigma like, ah, no, I don't want to go. Now, um, but everybody... It's a common pattern that everybody, a lot of guys do. And they don't want to socialize really. They go to school, do, the, do, do what they got to do and leave. They don't want to make friends on there. Just, you know, that's one thing they want to do. They just want to go to school, do that. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about because um, I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, things that happen. I could sit here and talk about it for an hour about all this stuff that, we go through, but like for VA appointments and you know with disabilities and all this stuff. Once you know with the VA, I went, I did go to the VA, got help and everything. They helped me out. You know they're great, but they kind of discharged me and said, "All right, you're, you're good. You know, time for the next guy. Cause there's more guys coming." Um, now I got to figure out my ways to deal with stuff. But at the time when I was going to school, they'll give me an appointment, and one appointment will lead to 10, 15 other appointments. You know, it's not like, oh, you just got an appointment, and you're, you're, you're good. You know, if you're doing, and when you're going to school, they tell you, all right, you go for your first screening, all right, cool, you know, they tell you, all right, you got this, 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 and that. Now, they put you in the system, and then everybody wants to contact you and set up appointments. Next thing you know, you got six, ten appointments, five appointments during a week, and you're like, start debating, well, I got school or my VA. And, and it gets kind of hard. So that's one thing that, I want to kind of inform you guys is that when it comes to appointments, we get tons of appointments. Um, but pretty much, that's it. Everything's going great. I'm still going to school here. I work full time. Um, I got a wife and kids. So I'm I'm always staying busy. Um, you know, I'm actually with my my schedule that I got. I've been procrastinating of a, uh, trying to apply at another uh, Cal State because I'm already at that. 60 over, over units, I'm like, all right, when I'm going to do it, I'm just kind of, you know, uh, procrastinating. But that's something, that's one of my goals that I'm going to do, you know, soon so I can leave, you know, go to my other school. But everything's going great. Um, but pretty much that's it. If you guys have any questions, you know, I'll be glad to answer unless you guys want to ask, ask questions later. So that's it. Any questions about it? Yeah. So like, is it hard for you to, to relate with people that aren't vets, or do you feel like you have a better time relating with people that are vets? Um, it's, yeah, well, a lot of my friends are vets due to the reason because we went to the same thing. Being in service and especially going to you know, combat, going to war, we're forced to get, you know, to mature like quickly. You can't act like a kid and, you know, do party and do stuff. We're, you know, we're forced to be kind of like more mature. We come back and the mentality is still the same. We're more of a kind of like, we're more mature and our, our peers that are not really, that haven't experienced that, they're, they're still in that party scene, want to party and do this stuff. And sometimes a lot of that stuff might trigger some of that stuff for us, or for especially or just me. I don't know, I can't be speaking for everybody else, but it, that's what I, how I feel. Like I do talk to some guys and if they're like in that, the maturity level, kind of like where I'm at, then we could you know, hang out. But a lot of those guys are still in that party scene, let's party, let's do this, let's do that, let's do this and that. Our thing is like, all right, we went through this, went to the military, now it's time to, you know, get a job, get an education, do something. We don't, well, me, I really don't want, especially because I'm married and I have family and kids, I don't got time to be kind of hanging out, you know, full fooling around. So, I don't know if that answered the question. So, any other questions? Is that?
that experience those symptoms, the, the survey and stuff like that, how do you re react to that? What does it do to you? What does it make you feel like? Like when I go through symptoms, or like my, you mean my PTSD and stuff like that? Or? Yeah. Well, at, at, at now, I, it's more understandable, you know, I could catch myself right away because I kind of educated myself, learned all about the symptoms, what triggers it and all that stuff. So I kind of, when something happens, I catch it right, you know, I catch it and I kind of use my cognitive awareness kind of like, all right, you know, you know, but before it was really frustrating because, you know, a lot of, a lot of this stuff was like, I know I'm capable of doing this stuff, but I can't do it, you know, and it, it used to get really frustrating because I'm like, even to this day, you know, I was thinking about it earlier today, uh, well, yesterday, I had an essay due last week, and I did it. But I was thinking about it yesterday, and I couldn't remember what I did my essay on. I was just like, and I was like, well, what did I do it? And I'm like, well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. And, and I knew I could go online and go check my stuff to see what I did, but I'm like, no, I gotta see how long I, it takes me to remember. And it took me half of the day to remember what, I, what kind of essay I did. And that's when it comes, I get frustrated, because before, I used to do everything good, fast, remember everything. Now it's like, it's it's a disability, but at the same time, I don't let that disability kind of hold me back. You know, I got to keep going. So it gets frustrating, though. Anything else? No. All right. And I, I wanted to point out one thing about uh, communicating with peers. Uh, uh, you know, Ozzy pointed it out. You come home and you, uh, you, you find that the topics of conversation are just like trivial, you know, and how can you relate? And yet also, if you turn to your fellow, fellow vets, that could be a reminder of an experience that you would rather not, you know, think about. And oftentimes they come back and there's really nobody to talk to. And so it can be very difficult. Okay, our final speaker is uh, Blas Villalobos. Hi, how are you guys doing? Uh, well, like Dr. Mike said, my name is Blas Villalobos. Um, brief history about my LBCC experience. I uh, actually started working here back in 2000, 2004, I think as a work-study student at the VA office. Um, I enlisted in the Marine Corps, you know, and you probably are going to hear a lot of similar things for all Marines here, so. Uh, I enlisted in 1999. I um, went to boot camp here in San Diego, and uh, early on they figured out I was a good shooter, so I actually got promoted in boot camp for that. And uh, my first duty station was with um, an experimental scout sniper platoon with a unit that wasn't really used to having those guys there. So um, went to my first unit, ended up going to Iraq in 2003, went through a lot of the same things that these guys went through. Um, I guess the hardest part, and it's already been covered so I don't want to go into it a lot again, uh, is the fact that you get out there, you get injured, and a day or two later you're back in, in service. So there's no break in between. You get there, do what you're going to do, get hurt, you get better, you get back out there. It's as simple as that. Uh, a lot of the issues that I'm dealing with, uh, some of which include PTSD, um, in the process of uh, going through the TBI issues, um, knee injections, because I got hurt while I was in the service, uh, a lot of those issues make it a lot more difficult for us to kind of transition back into society. Uh, most, if not all the, of um, the symptoms you guys see are not physical. So it's kind of hard for us to go to the uh, disabled student's office and say, hey, uh, I need help with this because we never really know how they're going to look at us. So um, that was my main issue. Uh, coming back from Iraq in 2003, my main problem was uh, self-medication. Uh, my younger brother enlisted, so it was kind of odd for me to self-medicate and start to get better, and then, bam, my younger brother gets shot in Iraq and goes back to Germany. Everybody thinks it's, it's the worst, 
and now I'm back to square one dealing with the same issues because now he's going through it so I'm having to deal with a lot of the same problems that I just kind of learned to work with so um, when I started working here the biggest problem I saw when I first checked into you know Long Beach City College was that I went to the LAC campus uh, when I asked about the Veterans Affairs Office nobody knew what I was talking about so I almost went back into the service I got so frustrated trying to find the office trying to figure out what I was gonna do that I actually went back to Texas and my wife dealt with everything I got one call uh, I got a call one day from my wife saying, okay, you're registered to start in this semester. This is what you're doing. These are your classes based on whatever they said. This is when you're going to start receiving your GI Bill. All you got to do is sign. And I mean, I, I really didn't have to go through a lot of it. So that made it a lot easier for me. Uh, when I finally started working here and I realized how the system worked, um, I started working with Frank, I started working with Dr. Mike, I started working with uh, one of the uh, former students, one of our, our former work study students here. Um, I realized that there are ways for us to get the help that we need. It just takes a little more time because a lot of the services uh, back then were not, or a lot of the uh, offices were not aware that there was a, a system that would help veterans. So that was the biggest problem. Uh, dealing with the VA was another issue. Uh, I didn't really get any services at the VA until about two years after I got out. Uh, that was due to issues that I had at, at home with the wife. Uh, she's the one that looked into it again. You know, she's the one that went to the VA and said, hey, this is what he's going through. This is what's going on at night. This is what's going on when we go to the store. This is what's going on when we go out to any public places. What can you guys do? Before I knew it, I got a call from the VA saying you have to check in this is what we gotta do and I was just upset at the fact that she kinda did all that behind my back and I really truly understood why she didn't until I checked into the VA I talked to them and I was able I was able to step away from everything basically and take a look at myself and see okay yeah this is what I'm going through this is what I'm experiencing and I was able to look at it from a different point of view. So, you know, almost getting divorced, that was one of the biggest problems. You know, uh, people that you talk to and the reason why we don't have friends who are not military is because you, a lot of people don't really understand why you do what you do. If, if, if I go out of Six Flags and I tell my friends, well, let's just go ahead and uh, kind of relax for a minute, you know, these guys are not going to understand why I'm saying that or why I'm asking to take a break. Whereas if I go out with Chris, if I go out with Ozzy, I go out with other people who are in the service with me, they would automatically pick up, up excuse me, they'll automatically pick up on it and say, cool, you're right, you know, let's take a break. Uh, that's the reason why I have uh, a lot of friends who are military. Um, PTSD has been a big, big issue in my life. Numbness, good example. I was talking to Frank two days ago. I told him one of my wife's relatives died uh, two days ago. And I, I have to be brutally honest. I, I don't care. I see people crying around us. I see my wife crying about it. I see her mom. They try to come up to me and talk about it. I have to sit there and pretend that I care when, when I don't. I don't care. And that is one of the hardest things that we had to deal with because we do have people that we care about, but we don't show it a lot of time. We don't really, we can't sit there and cry about, you know, someone or over someone that we didn't really know. I probably will feel worse if someone I knew from the service died and it's happened. So I feel more when that occurs than when someone I don't really know, you know, passes away, even if they are related to someone I love. I, I, that's just, it's hard for people to comprehend. So, um, you know, the VA has been great for me and I'll, I'll back them up. You know, well, as soon as I checked in, it started helping me out and I've seen it progress from one tiny office where I checked in 
to talk about my issues because I was an Iraq or Afghanistan veteran to a huge center. They have a huge transition center now where every single Iraq and Afghanistan veteran uh, has to check into. And they will get you an appointment within seven days. Was that the case back then? No. Is it the case with every single veteran? It's not. But in my experience, that's what's happened. Um, it has helped me a lot. Um, I mean, right now I'm, I'm at Cal State Long Beach. I'll graduate in May, working on my application for a master's in social work at USC. Hopefully, if everything goes well, I'll get in. If I don't, I'll move on. It's not a big deal. You know, but the matter or the fact of the matter is that the help that we are getting through the VA office here at Long Beach City College or through the VA office at Cal State Long Beach, through the VA Medical Center, that help is allowing us to do what we really want to do. Are we always going to be different than most people? Yeah. You know, am I always going to be acting the same way I, I act around people? I don't know. Probably. You know, but I can adapt. You know, my instructors know who I am at Cal State Long Beach. You know, one of them in, in specific uh, picked up on it right away. You know, first day of class. Yeah, I'm sitting up in the front, but I'm way off on the side. And she was like, well, do you mind moving up to the, I'm like, no. And she picked up on it quick. So I was kind of, you know, it's it great to have her pull me out to the side after class and say, hey, um, I noticed you didn't want to do this. Do you mind explaining to me why? Because you kind of put me in the spot. You know, and, and I talked to her about it, and she was very helpful about it. Uh, an exam that I had to take three weeks ago, and I couldn't be there because of a, of a VA appointment, uh, she rescheduled for me. So people are going out of their way to help us out, but we do have to kind of meet them halfway. You know, you can't just sit there and say, well, I'm going to leave it all to the civil student's office, because uh, it's too easy for us to say that. It, it, it is. You know, and we put a lot of responsibility on, th on these guys, and they, they do a great job. But at the same time, I kind of feel that if we meet them halfway, we can, we can get more accomplished. And in my experience, that's, that has been the case. Um, again, I'm still dealing with a lot of the issues. My brother re-enlisted. So every time I hear that there's a possibility that he's going back to Iraq, I'm like, well, we'll give you till May. He's like, give me a chance to get my BA so I can go back in as an officer, transfer out to your unit, and then we can all head out, you know, and have your family out there or whatever. And I see it as a, it, it, to me, it's a, it's a joke. You know, I see it as an exciting adventure, I guess, regardless of what I've seen or what I've done in the service in the past, which is, has caused so much pain and suffering on my part. I'm still willing to go back. You know, I'm still willing to do it again. Um, some may say it's crazy, but... It, it, you have to understand that it's kind of it's kind of difficult to explain it. You know, the fact that you still have people who are re-enlisted, who are re-enlisted. Yeah, we have friends who have died out there, but we do have friends who stayed in, who lived in our back in Iraq or Afghanistan, and you feel like you're the you're the uh, the traitor, I guess, because now you're out of the service. You're not there with them. You know, you're not backing them up whereas they backed you up back in the day when you were still in with them. So in my case, you know, I'd, would I go back if my brother go back, uh, goes back to Iraq? Probably. I mean, I have a wife and I have a daughter. I love my daughter, you know. And uh, when people ask, well, why, why would you go back? You wouldn't stay with your, your kid. Um, it, it sounds, you know, rude or whatever, but, I mean, my daughter will be taken care of if, anything happens to me. And I, all I can do is hope that she will understand that what I did, I did it for the right reasons. So a lot of times people look at that and say, well, he just, does he care? Does he not care? You know, but it's just kind of hard to, hard to explain. Um, but again, you know, everything is well. Uh, we are dealing with the issues, but we learn to adapt and overcome them. And again, the VA office, the disabled students office, uh, has done a great, a great deal to help us get through it and, and to make sure that we actually succeed and, and in the end, you know, become productive members of society, which is what everybody wants us to be. It will just probably take us a little longer to, <laughs> to get there. That's about it. Okay, any, any questions or thoughts? So if your brother doesn't agree on it, does that mean that you won't? Yeah, I won't. 
just started school and he didn't really realize what was going on with you. If as, as staff here or faculty here, we run into students who are veterans who have these type of symptoms and issues, can you, do you have any suggestions on how we can approach them to get the help they need? Well, I think, uh, at least in my case, you know, I did have some issues with, with some instructors. And again, I had no idea that what I was going through was as a consequence of my service in Iraq. So when instructors came up to me and said, hey, well, how do you feel about this? Or what's going on that's causing you to show up to class smelling like alcohol, <laughs> you know? Um, I, I kind of took a, uh, I don't know, defensive stance and, and I just I just didn't want to hear it you know um, I think that the best uh, possible approach would be to kind of talk to them and see if they are willing to talk to to other vets uh, talk to someone at the VA office because again you know out of uh, the four people that work there two of us I think yeah two of us have been on rack and back and when we talk to guys who are checking in, you know, the first thing they, they say is, I just want to get my money, I want to go to school, I don't want to be bothered, and, but as soon as they realize that, wait a minute, I'm talking to someone who was in Iraq as well, chances are he's going or has gone through the same things I have, they open up. It, it just completely, the, the barriers just, just crumble. So I think um, if you guys can, can get them to talk to someone at the VA office or talk to a school psychologist or someone that, uh, that will actually be able to guide them in the right direction, that'll be great. More questions? Right. And finally, we have uh, Frank Menjavar who's gonna talk about uh, some of the current things we're plan doing and planning in the uh, Veterans Affairs office. Thank you. Good morning. Um, on behalf of myself, the VA Office of Financial Aid Office, I want to thank you for coming today. Um, we take, Mike and I take the opportunity to present or provide information to our faculty and staff, other colleges and universities of what we're doing in our office. We feel that um, if somebody hears what we're doing and they pass that information along and they can help a veteran, we feel that we've done uh, a service. Okay. Um, we have a couple, I have a couple of notes, you guys have that um, with you, I'm just going to read through it. If you have any questions, just feel free to answer, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and, and I'll take your questions. Um, what I've also included um, is I read an article on National Council Magazine, uh, it's called This Is My Story, I gave you a copy of that, and it talks a little bit about what the guys spoke about. Um, Blas spoke about how it, he would feel um, it would be worse for him to hear that one of his veteran's friends passed away than it was for a friend of the family. And on, on here it tells about the story of a soldier who actually had his whole unit die and he was left by himself and he had to come home and deal with that. Um, and then it took just one person hearing, reading the story of what happened to him and say, you know what, why don't you go ahead and talk to this person? And so it just took just that one person to take the initiative and say, you know what, do you need help? Just to make that change. And at the end of the story, you'll hear that he's now in school and he's um, a pre-med student. So um, I just want to go ahead and pass that along to you. Uh, now, I'm going to go ahead and cover, um, like Mike said, a lot of the things that we've done in the past, what we're doing now and in the future. Um, but we... My primary objective, um, besides assisting our veterans here, is more or less educating our faculty and staff, educating other colleges and universities to let them know um, what their capabilities are. Okay? Um, and then um, the notes that I have here, um, Danielle Panto, our certified official, went ahead and typed up for us. Uh, and she has uh, the first paragraph, I want to go ahead and read that because uh, I think it's very important. It says, consider how difficult it would be living, working, and fighting in a foreign land far away from family and friends for extended periods of time. Then consider how hard it would be to come back and readjust to your former life. For men and women coming home, it can be difficult to acclimate back into civilian life. This difficulty can be compounded when transitioning into student life. In response, our office wants to help educate faculty and staff 
on how we can best serve our veteran students. And um, just for example, this particular um, panel that we have, situations like today is what we really like uh, to be a part of. Um, our aim is to improve uh, both our communication and our relationships, um, stressing the importance of sharing information and what we're doing in our office, not only with other departments, uh, but again, and I'll say this over and over again with other colleges and universities. Um, we found out, we've done many presentations at financial aid conferences. Uh, Mike and I were always in the idea that we were, uh, you know, a couple years behind um, everyone else. Um, after doing last year's presentations, we uh, got a lot of praise uh, for our panel and for the uh, work that we have done to help our veterans. And they kind of more or less assured us that we are in the forefront um, when it comes to um, helping veterans.